what I'm arguing is that the theory of proportion is what allows us to speak about these objects. So it allows us to speak about, for example, geometrical objects or triangles themselves. And there's a long story about why that is the case. It allows us to speak about numbers themselves. So these are the kinds of objects of pure mathematics, as opposed to empirical mathematics. More importantly, what a theory of proportion, and in fact it's a geometric theory of proportion as opposed to an uh, arithmetic one, and I won't get into the details of that, but what a geometric theory of proportion allows us to do is it allows us to organize arithmetic so that we get numbers as geometric measures. as opposed to numbers as arithmetic units. And what that allows us to do, interestingly enough, is to include irrational numbers. Please switch pens down the stage. Okay, I will do. So, it allows us to include irrational numbers, and so what the theory of proportion does is it allows us both to organize our mathematical kinds of objects and it allows us to solve mathematical problems. Now interestingly, the theory of proportion again has no objects, so it's not providing us with a metaphysics for mathematics. And then once we get these triangles themselves, numbers themselves, proportions, then we can get to applied math. So, oh, this is much better. Thank you. We get to applied math, so in the case of our theory of proportion, we get to cosmology, and, you know, my spelling is just going to be, and in spherical geometry, we get to astronomy, and I'm just going to leave the details, <laughs> because what I want to point out is that how Plato is usually read is that, and I'm going to try, and I might forget, to always put things I disagree with in red. <laughs> so Plato is usually read as, oh, no, you're not going to like that. Okay. Let's try green then. Okay. Green does not stand for good, it's bad, is that somehow we have a theory of forms and it's the theory of forms that is providing us with this solid foundation or account of these objects. What I want to argue is that that's not the, not the right picture for Plato. So let's see what we've gotten to in our slides. So remember how I began, how I began is by saying for Plato, it's the precision of definitions and the stability of method um, that allows us to talk about the exactness of mathematics. So the other thing that Plato says, and maybe, no, I can't fit it in there, is that the philosopher's method is distinct from the uh, mathematician's method. So the mathematician uses the hypothetical method and the philosopher is supposed to use the dialectical method. So the hypothetical method starts with a hypothesis. From your hypothesis, you reason downward. And then what happens as the result of your reason, reasoning downward, right? you look at whether or not it's always an answer to a question that you set up a hypothesis. And if it's internally consistent, you say, well, I've got a possible answer, and it's possible because you began with a hypothesis. And if it's inconsistent, right, you have a reductio, impossible. Now, the philosopher's method is different from this thinking, in the sense that you're not reasoning downward from a hypothesis, 
what you're supposed to do is reason upwards towards a first principle. So the mathematician's method is part of this. So you get something that's possible. And then you say, OK, what are the conditions for that possibility? And what you have to do is you have to travel back upwards to some first principle. And that first principle provides an account of your hypothesis. So many people have argued that the mathematician is supposed to undertake the dialectical method. And if that's the case, we require first principles. That is, we're going to require a stable domain of objects, these forms, and they're going to provide our first principles or our account of our hypothesis. So what this account does is it provides fixity to your object. And again, my project for Plato, at the very least, has been to show no, no. Plato nowhere says that the hypothetical method, right, or the dialectical method must be undertaken by the mathematician. OK, so enough of Plato. So what we get then is that the account of the exactness of the exact sciences lies in a mathematical theory, right? Right? A theory of proportion, not in a metaphysical theory. And it rests in a mathematical theory because our method is in some sense hypothetical. It's not dialectic, that it, it does not require fixity. So let's travel onward now. I'm skipping a few thousand years. Now we want to say the exactness of mathematics lies in the precision and definitions of the stability and now of the axiomatic method. So what is at stake is whether this method is hypothetical in nature or it's not. And so this brings us to another debate. And that's the debate between Frege and Hilbert. I know, Plato, Frege, Hilbert. We're moving quickly. So, we move to say, well, it's the axiomatic method that we're looking at. And then we ask, well, what's the relationship between the axiomatic method and the precision of definitions? And we get a separation. So we have Frege, and then we have Hilbert. Again, these are sketches. I know there's a lot of details to be worked out here. So Frege is going to say, OK, <clears throat> we must begin. So we begin with definitions. And then our axioms are truths about the objects so defined. And so what we require there is a fixed domain of reference. On the other hand, we have Hilbert, and he says axioms are schema, or another way of saying is the axioms are implicit definitions. What's interesting is we don't require a fixed domain, right? We have a variable domain. And this leads to different conceptions in what we require of a foundation. So if you're on the Frege side, right, your foundation must fix your domain in some logical sense or in some ontological sense. And, and there you get different kind of interpretations of Frege. You have this Platonist component <coughs> right, versus this logicist component, and you can work out the details. But nonetheless, you get a foundation as something that must fix the domain, similar to this account here. Right? You need something that's going to provide you with fixity. On the other hand, Hilbert seems fine. <coughs> 
right? So here we have a foundation as something that organizes. Organizes. And for Hilbert, it's the axioms themselves as schema that act as organizational features. So again, this is another component to this. We're on our way now to mathematical structural. So the axiomatic method and the demand for rigor yield structures and not objects. And this is really worked out in great detail in Burgess's recent book. I didn't put the dates down for anything. So again, in answer to the question wherein lies the exactness of mathematics, we've got that the exactness of mathematics is found in talk about structures, not objects. Right? So we get the account here. So we've got the axiomatic method. And from this, we get that we get structures as opposed to objects. And again, that's worked out by Burgess. So then the next question becomes, how are we supposed, sorry, I'm, I've got my di diagrams worked out here, category theory diagrams, you know. Um, what do we mean by structures or structure? Let's just put structure there for now. And then philosophically, right, we get the Nasrath. And Ben Asraf points out that if we're on the Phrygian side with this fixed domain, we run into a problem. We run into a problem because we get the result that mathematical objects are not fixed Phrygian objects or set theoretic objects. Right? So we get this result. I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm assuming you're familiar with it. So in one set theoretic system, we're going to get, say, 2 is an element of 3. And in another, we're going to get 2 is not an element of 3. And so what we're left to conclude is something like, right, what's important about the number 2 is captured by its structure, not by its intrinsic or uh, fixed interpretation. So there we are. What we get from that then is this anti-realist view about objects. And then we get the slogan of mathematical structuralism. So we get mathematical structuralist who says, okay, now we're going to just consider objects as nothing but a position. Why do we get that conclusion? We get that conclusion because when we look at the axiomatic method, it tells us let's focus on structure. When we look at the point Ben Asraf is making, it says don't look for referential fixity. And so we get structure is prior to objects, whatever that means. <clears throat> so it's here that we have to now ask our next question. So our next question, if we want to be mathematical structuralists, I don't know where we are. Again, so now we've got question two. So we've still got that um, the exactness of mathematics lies in the axiomatic method and the precision of its definitions. But now we've got the claim that it's structure that we should be focusing on and not objects. So where in lies the conditions for speaking about structures or structured systems? That becomes our next task. And uh, let's see, put it over here. And this is really a philosophical debate. So one could say, here's where we are. Here's what 
we as mathematical structuralists all have in common, right? Two claims that structure is fire and that objects are positions. And the type of things that we're talking about are object language, are things like numbers, groups, so forth and so on. So at some level, as mathematical structuralists, we all agree on this picture. Right? Where we disagree, again, green is the disagree. So, we could say, well, he asked this question, wherein lies the conditions for talking about system or structures? It lies in set theory. And then what we've got is, Objects are positions in any or all systems that have the same structure. And there are two routes to go here, right? And these two routes are worked out in Dedekind. So what you could say is there's a privileged structure, right, which captures the shared structure of all of your systems, or you could just say at a systems level. And then this notion of shared structure, if you're in set theory, is usually captured by isomorphism. And we know there are problems with this view. I'm not going to talk about this. So what's our next option? Right. Our next option is, instead of going to a mathematical theory, is to go to a more philosophical theory. So we could use anti rem structuralism of Shapiro. Actually, I'd like to put, see if that red works. I really am committed to putting those theories in red. <laughs> <laughs> so we have anti rem structuralism. And the idea here is that an object is a position in an abstract structure. Now again, right, position here really is a place, for those of you familiar with Shapiro, because again, we're talking about an abstract structure. And what's interesting is that those structures for Shapiro are actual. That's what makes it anti rem So we're committed here to saying that structures are prior. Oh, I think you said a prior. And then we're not happy with that because we don't want actual structures. We could go the monodominalist route, right? And we can say an object is a position in any or all possible systems. So we eliminate talk about structures, and we just talk about possible systems. Now, interestingly, when it comes to talk about those possible systems, what we're going to discover is that we need this notion of concreta. Concreta become the things that fill in the positions of possible structures. So we have to take, in some sense, concreta or concrete systems as prior. And again, I'm not getting into the metaphysics of that because I don't want to. All right, so our next option is in blue, <laughs> is to use category theory. And of course, that's what I've argued, right? That an object is a position in a cat structured system, or in any or all cat structured systems. 
So again, similar to Hellman's view, this is an in-ray view as opposed to an anti-rem view. However, what is different is that nothing is taken as prior here. So here, right, usually what gets used for your set theoretic account is ZFC. So in some sense, you have to assume that sets are prior. Here you have to assume systems are prior. Here you've got concreta as prior. Here, nothing needs to be assumed as prior. This is where people got confused because it was the assumption, oh, you're going to have to assume categories as prior in the same way that you assume sets as prior. And what I tried to argue is that the only things that are prior on this account are the axiom system. So we have three types of axiom systems if we want to characterize structure in category theoretic terms. We could look at the eilenberg maclean axioms, right, where we just start out with objects and arrows, and we can fill in what we mean by objects and arrows with things like sets and functions, groups, natural transformations. We could also look at the ETCS axioms where we presume our objects and arrows are sets and functions. And out of that, we can build up a set theory that's at least as strong as ZFC, although some people don't believe that, but that's fine. And then finally, we have the CCAF axioms. And that allows us to talk about the shared structure of categories themselves in terms of functors. So again, what I've argued is for this picture, and the reason that I've argued for this picture and against the other pictures is because I'm firmly on this side of the divide. So what I've argued is that if we assume sets as prior, we now have to either use set theory as a foundation or we have to give, I erased it, but over here, remember, we have this notion uh, of fixity. We have a fixed domain. So for set theory, our fixed domain is sets. Of course, you could use a class theory or a irrelevant set theory, but something is always going to be fixed. Right? For Hilbert, you don't have fixity, and you don't require fixity. So, the position I've argued for is this position here. And what I've argued, again, is category theory has it so that objects are positions in a cat structured system. So, again, what I've argued is that set theory or anti-rem structuralism, modal nominalism, see axioms as asserting truths over a fixed domain, right? They're over here. So they must assume their theory as, in some sense, a foundation, right? Whether that's set theory or structure theory, or in the case of uh, Hellman, it's a modal interpretation of concreta, but anyways, um, something must act as a foundational meta-language for talking about structures or systems. And these are sets, actual structures, possible systems. Those are taken, and I'm borrowing a distinction found in Aristotle, as prior in place. Anytime we talk about prior in place, we ask questions like where? How do we access them? And then we start talking metaphysically. I don't want to do that. On the other hand, category theory sees the axioms as schema that organize what we say about systems that have a structure without providing that first principled account of what structures or systems are. So, these axioms, the EM axioms, ETCS, CCAF, right, we have a notion of priority, but it's prior in definition, not prior in place. So again, the analogy I'm trying to work up to is that category theory as a framework here 
is acting in a very similar way that the theory of proportion is acting in Plato. Because it's allowing us to organize what we say about structure, the structure of numbers, groups, and what's interesting is that it not, excuse me, it not only allows us to talk about the structure of numbers and groups, but we get a lot more things in here. So we get topological spaces. We also get proofs, which is interesting. Right? We also get sets via the ETHCS axioms. So it's this organizational language that doesn't commit us to a fixed domain. So, again, our object language, the things we're talking about, our numbers, groups, proofs, sets, so forth, topological spaces, even categories. Right? If we want to talk about categories, let's use these axioms. Those are the axioms for categories. So where lies the conditions for speaking about structures or structured systems? Right? So, Plato presents us with this option. Should we look for those conditions in mathematics or in metaphysics? And me, with Plato and Carnap, because you've got to throw Carnap in there, are going to say that those conditions should be found in mathematics, not in metaphysics. So, for set theory and category theory, the conditions are found in a mathematical theory. So, again, these are in red, those are out. Metaphysical theory is gone. This is a possibility, but again, it commits me to a fixed domain of sets. So it commits me to the claim that numbers really are sets, groups really are sets, that proofs really have a set structure. Because all I have access to is to talk about set structure. And that's a problem. And it's not a problem because, look, we all know that the reductions are possible. But does it account for what we actually do in mathematics to solve problems? And that's what we're trying to capture, I hope, as philosophers of mathematics, is how do we solve mathematical problems? That's what I want to capture. So. Again, we could have set theory or uh, category theory. We could give a schematic reading of set theory. Right? So we could say those axioms are just schema that organize. The problem is that, again, we have a fixed domain. Some other problems. So again, we can give a schematic reading of set theory, but we've got a fixed domain. Set theory requires a distinction between set and algebraic structures. So if we're going to use isomorphism, we've got a problem when we're talking about abstract algebraic structures versus set structures, if we're going to try to capture those in terms of isomorphism. We also have a problem in making a distinction between what we now call concrete sets versus abstract sets, or in general, concrete structures versus abstract structures. I also think that category theory does a better job at capturing just the notion of shared structure. Right? It does that, and that claim there is a little more vague than I wanted it to. If you want to capture the shared structure of categories, you use functors. That's what this set of axioms tells you. But if you use, suppose you're looking at the oliver mclean axioms where, for example, suppose as your objects you have groups, your uh, arrows, if you're talking about group structure, are natural transformations. So what it tells you is, if you want to account for the shared structure of anything that's group structure, look to the natural transformation. And so what's interesting about category theory is that <coughs> At each level, it's going to give you an account of shared structure. So there is no global notion of shared structure between systems. There's a flexibility. And again, 
Sometimes you can give a global account. People do that. And then they look at things like um, adjoint functors. You've probably seen that in left and right adjoint functors. So there are some universal features that one finds in category theory. But again, at each level where you instantiate these axioms, you're going to get a different notion of shared structure. Also, category theory takes the objects of mathematics at face value, right? So, whether we're looking at numbers or groups or proofs or sets, we don't have to affect a reduction of those to sets to talk about their structure. So there's no reductive element when you talk about category theory. And finally, the appl applicability of structure in science, I would say, is explained at the object level, not the meta level. So what I'm trying to get at here, what's my time? I have 20 left? Okay. Is that when we now go to look at, remember our last question is, what explains the exactness of the exact sciences? What I want to say is that it's structure here that explains the exactness of the exact sciences, not any of these meta-languages. And that's been a huge problem in philosophy. I'm going to talk about some of those problems. Because what ends up happening is you've got these people looking at the role of structure in science. And instead of looking at the role that these structures play, they start looking at the frameworks. And then there's mass confusion. So again, the idea that the applicability of structure is explained at the object level, allows us to say, let's focus here. Even if category theory is this meta language, that doesn't mean it has any role to play in the account of the applicability to mathematics, unless one of those things in there is a category. And we see more and more, both in uh, space-time theories and quantum mechanical theories, that categories are being used. So yeah, then they get to jump into here. But they get to jump into there because they're being used in a scientific theory, not because category theory is a meta language. Okay. So wherein lies the exactness of the exact sciences? So again, when we speak about or we attempt to answer this question, we have three components in philosophy of science where we ask this question. So we could look at, remember, we're taking this structuralist route. So somehow we're committed to the claim that the exactness of the exact sciences lies in the applicability of mathematical structure, right? Not in objects, but in structure. And we could talk about that in three ways. So we could talk about the structure of a scientific theory. And Supis has done that with set theory, more particular with a Urelman set theory. Stephen French has done it with what he calls a partial structures approach. Worrell uses uh, type theory. More recently, Hans Halverson is using category theory to talk about the structure of scientific theories. We can also talk about the structure of a scientific theory, one theory, right? The structure of quantum mechanics, the structure of a space time theory. And again, we have Supis who uses set theory for this. French, we have two versions of French. In one version, he uses partial structures. In the other, he uses group theory. Worrell sticks with type theory. Bain, more recently, has argued for the use of category theory and group theory and space-time theories. And then, finally, we say the exactness of the exact sciences lies in the applicability of structure when we're talking about the structure of the world. And that's the claim of the structural view. I'm not going to talk about the structure of scientific theories. I'm going to focus on B and C and see what kind of account of the applicability of structure in science is the best account and where things go oh so horribly wrong. So, with respect to C, I want to say we should be realists about the structure of the world and not the object. 
So that's really the beginning of structural realism. Let's see if it's blue, if I might be red. And it's, it's very analogous to the debate that went on in mathematical structuralism. So we had realism about objects, and we had not realism about objects. Right? And that was really um, codified well in the Banasrat paper. The Banasrat paper said, well, if you're a realist, then you're going to get referential semantics. That's a good thing. But here's the problem. Right? You then look for a cosmal or reasonable epistemology, and it seems like you're committed to non-realism. And structuralism aims to reach a midpoint because it says epistemic access to structure is via the axes. So again, it gives you a reasonable account of how you came to know what a group was or what a uh, number was. That is, you took the axioms as prior, you took them as implicit definitions, and you got some epistemic account of them. And then, out of that, right, you got, and again in Hilbert, what you get is this claim that consistency implies existence. We usually don't say that anymore, but we get something like as I said, an object is a position in a structure. So we get reference, right? Whether that reference is in a fixed structure or in systems that have a structure. And the analogy I want to point out is now, so this is mathematical structuralism, and then we have structural realism, and the idea here is, well, telling in the favor of realism is the numericals argument, Telling in the favor of anti-realism is the pessimistic meta-induction argument. And Morrill comes along and he says, well, let's focus on structure. Right? So again, epistemic access is to structure, not objects. And there's another analogy that you could build up. So again, with mathematical structuralism, right, we have three options. Right? We could say an object is a position and read that as an ontological position. And that's Shapiro. A modal position. And that's Hellman. Or a methodological position. And that's me. Because for me, I don't take the axioms as resulting from any fixed domain. And over here, we get the same option. So we could just read this as an epistemological position. That's known as ESR. Again, that's Morrill's phrase. We could go even further, and that's French. And he wants to say, that tells us that there are no objects that all there is to this position is its structure. And then finally, you could get the methodological position again, and look, that's Catherine Breeding and myself. So that's the position we attempted to work out. Okay, so we see how structure gets used to give an account of exactness or applicability in science, and now I want to end up by the title, Mathematics is Not Metaphysics. So, things have gone very, very badly for the structural realism. And I want to just briefly, how many minutes do I have? Five minutes. Very briefly, <laughs> give some account of where I think things have gone so horribly wrong. And it's the confusion of mathematics with metaphysics. I wish I 
plan this a little better, but we'll get the conclusion out here. So, French, again, right, he's the ontic structural realist. And there's a common core that I'm going to use. So, what happens is we look at the role of group theory in quantum mechanics, and what we get as a result of looking at the natural transformations and the symmetries is we get that all we know about bosons, fermions, so forth, and so on is their group structure. It's a group structure. And now, French wants to claim, oh, that's an ontic structural realist position. How does he do that? Well, he says, well, look, the structure of a scientific theory is given by partial structures, right? And the structure of scientific theories is as well, but we don't need that for this point. And what he says is, okay, we've got epistemic structural realism. Then we're going to add to that metaphysical underdetermination, that is, um, in quantum mechanics, our theories are such that they can't tell us whether these things we're referring to are individuals or not. And look, what happens, according to him, is we get OSR. So, what I pointed out is, okay, I'm agreeing with this picture, that's great. Here's the problem, you don't need this. That's not doing any work. And in fact, if you keep insisting that notions of shared structure or what a structure is should be given in terms of partial structures, you're going to lose this argument. Because what happens is that if you represent group structure in terms of partial structures, or basically just set theory, you lose the fact that what's doing the work here is group theoretic transformations. Because now group theoretic transformations have to be cast in set theoretic terms, and now you've lost permutation groups. So that was the first thing that I did to argue against that position. So was, this picture's fine. You don't need this. It's not doing any work. Then, so that's French one. French two, then went, so again, this is supposed to be in red, that's what we don't like. Then what he said was, okay, I really want to get OSR, so I'm going to go from quantum mechanical objects are group structured, to all theories are group structured, to Group theory provides a metaphysics for the world. So the world itself is group structured. Oh, well, now we can get OSR. And that to me is a confusion of metaphysics and mathematics. <coughs> so that was that. I won't have time to go through syllabus. What I want to do is get to do I have a couple more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if we have time, okay, well let's just quickly, so this is French, again, so here's the Sillos picture, right, we get to some structure, here's the issue with Sillos, so Sillos is going to presume that whatever metaphysics we have, that should be in red, at any rate, is a causal metaphysics. So that what he says is, if you have a causal metaphysics, then Rolada must be prior to relations. Okay, well why? Okay, well, you know, because Rolada are the bearers of causes. Oh, now we get objects back because they're bearers of causes according to Silos in virtue of their intrinsic properties. Okay, fine. I don't agree with any of that, but that's fine. Here's what he then does. So, here's my causal metaphysics. And then, he says, okay, the only account of mathematical structuralism that will account for my causal metaphysics 
is the in-ray structures. So however, we're going to talk about the structure of theories. It has to be in terms of in-ray structure. Okay, that seems to be fine. Next step. Now we're going to go to mathematical structure. And what does he say? He says, and this is justified mathematically, wait for it, because, let's go back to that example, the Banasrap example doesn't show that objects are just positions in a structure. In fact, what it shows, because 2 is an element of 3 in one system and not an element of 3 in another, according to Silos, this shows us that 2 has intrinsic properties. <coughs> So that he's going from his causal metaphysics in through structure as we find it in science now to a pronouncement about mathematical structure. So again, here we have French and he's working from his physics to metaphysical claims and metaphysical claims that are really confusing the mathematical structure that gets used here with the mathematical structure that gets used to talk about your metaphysics. I don't know that you should be using mathematics to talk about metaphysics, but okay. Over here, we've got a kind of the opposite problem where we're moving from some metaphysical claim to now a claim about mathematical structuralism. So that's one set of confusions, and I'm going to go really quick with this. But I want to end with this because it's something that, if I have to go to another conference and hear this, I'm going to harm myself. So, here's some things that I've heard for a very long time. Set theory requires or demands, tells us that relata are prior to relations. And you go, what? How? How does step theory do that? So again, it's reading step theory as making metaphysical claims. So far as I can tell, the argument goes like this. Step theory requires elements, right? And typically when people say this, they go, okay, because what's a structure? Oh, well, a structure, elements, functions, properties. All right, so if we're going to frame talk about structures in set theory, oh look, we need elements. Like what? So what I want to point out is that, well, in ZFC, which is usually the language we use to talk about sets, elements aren't prior. In fact, there are no elements that are not sets. So the only elements whatever we mean by that, are sets. That is, remember what an element is in set theory, it's anything that occupies a position there. Well, in ZFC, the only things that occupy these things are sets. Now, again, a lot of the time in science or in talk about the structure of science, this presumption gets made that we're using naive sets that sets somehow are made up of elements. And in fact, as I mentioned, Supi does use a irrelevant set theory. So there we have elements, but they're bare. Right? So even in, say, a irrelevant set theory, yeah, okay, you have elements, but they're bare. They are bare. So you can't use this to say elements are prior. And you certainly can't use this to say that they have intrinsic properties, which I've seen. So that's the set theory thing that makes me crazy. And more recently, let's talk about the category theory thing that makes me crazy. So the idea here is, well, set theory commits us to relations are prior to relata. And these are claims made by Bain. 
And he says, well, category theory shows us that's not the case. Why? Well, because in set, that is the category of sets, right, your relata, again, your elements, whatever that means, are just arrows. And somehow, that's most supposed to make relata into relations, so that we don't require relata. But here's the thing, that has nothing to do with the status of relata or the status of relations. It's because in set, membership is not primitive. That is, there is no talk of elements. You can uh, add membership via adding additional absence, but it's not a primitive. So there is no talk of elements. And again, the reason for that is because you don't have membership. It's not because you're reducing your relata to arrows. Finally, his next claim is he says, and furthermore, structures don't require objects in the way that relata don't require relations because in cat, that is the category of categories, structures are prior to objects. Here's the problem with that, is that he's reading categories as prior in the way that one reads sets as prior for set theory. So it is the case that structure is prior to objects for any mathematical structuralist. But the reason for the priority is not because you have a fixed domain of categories. So cat, that is the category of categories, does not provide a fixed domain of categories. It's because the CCAF axioms are prior. So it has nothing to do with the ontological status of categories is because we're talking about categories themselves as things generated by the axioms. Okay, I'm going to end up here. And so, just concluding, wherein lies the exactness of mathematics? The exactness of mathematics lies in the precision and of its definitions and the stability of method. The axiomatic method, right, with axioms as implicit definitions, yields schema for talking about axiom systems that have a structure. The exactness of mathematics it lies in speaking about structure, not objects. Structure is prior to objects. So again, this is just mathematical structuralism. Where lies the conditions for speaking about that? For me, it's taking category theory as an organizational tool, right? Again, as a Carnapian linguistic framework, um, it provides a meta-language for speaking about a structured system without a metaphysics of sets or of categories or of actual systems or possible systems. And finally, the net exactness of the exact sciences lies in the applicability of object-level mathematical structure. Right, of object level mathematical structure. It does not lie in any metaph metaphysical theory for mathematical structure, so in set theory or in partial structures or in category theory, nor does it lie in any metaphysical theory for physical structure. That is, in a causal metaphysics, or I mean, I don't know what to make of this group theoretic metaphysics, but. Um, so again, the position I argue for with respect to mathematics is that category theory provides the best language for expressing our commitments to mathematical structuralism. And then the position I argue for in this last question is that given the precision and stability of object-level mathematical structure against successive and successful scientific theories, we should be realists about structure, not objects. Right? So we should be realists 
about the group theoretic structure of quantum mechanical objects. We don't then jump to the conclusion that that's all objects are. We don't then make pronouncements about whether these are individuals or not. We just stop here. And more importantly, we don't look to these metaphysical or metamathematical frameworks to explain the role that structure plays in science. And I'm done.